Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone for joining. This is the second in the series uh, Tech Lunch for HFI Kenya 2020 program. Uh, my name is Dan Sweeney and I'm going to be presenting today uh, for our Tech Lunch on fuel standards. And in particular, we're going to talk a little bit about the new KEB standard, Kenya Bureau of Standards um, document, which outlines uh, new requirements for charcoal and carbonized briquettes. Uh, but we'll do a little bit of background and motivate, you know, why we actually need standards as well. So the goals for this today's that today's session are: why do we have standards? Why do we need them? Why are they useful? Then we'll look specifically at the new KEB standard, um, which is called DKS 2912. 2020. Um, I think it'll end up being KS2912. Right now it's it's still in a draft form. So then finally we'll look at what are the implications uh, of these standards for our businesses in HFI Kenya. Um, so just a quick how to uh, instruction. I, I want to try to do a little poll of the group. So um, what we're going to attempt to do is use uh, annotating or doodling on Zoom. So on the call here, we're actually going to do a little bit of drawing on the screen. So I think maybe now you can see I've just drawn a red spiral. So I want us to, to all let me just clear that. So we will, we're all going to do that here on the next couple of slides. I think if you're on a mobile phone, you should see a little pencil icon, something like this, in the lower left of your screen. Um, so when you click that, then you'll get a, a group of settings here, uh, options. So you can choose a pen or a highlighter. I think on your desktop, you'll get something in the, the, either in a similar location or up in the bar up near the top of the screen. So we'll try here on the next couple of slides to just um, put some marks on the screen on a series, on a scale, uh, in terms of our understanding. So the first question that we're going to mark for is, how familiar are you with the cabs? DKS 2912-2020. So now if you can make a mark on this scale, I'm going to make my mark of how familiar you are, if you're able to. So mine, I'll put I think I'm becoming more familiar, but Still not very familiar. And if you can't make a mark, if you can't figure that out, you can also just put it in the chat. So I put A, B, and C also. Okay, so Dorothy is somewhat familiar, so that's good. Kevin also somewhat familiar. Um, great. So it looks sound looks like uh, most of our group here are at least a bit familiar with these standards. Um, so then there's one more question. Um, so since you are a bit familiar, will your product be compliant with Kev's DKS two? 2912. So would your product actually comply with the, re the requirements in the new standard? I mean, if you don't know, there's an option for that. And if you're not familiar with the standard. Um, so for me, my product right now, I don't know.
So you can go ahead and make another mark. Or just type into the chat. And it looks like pretty much all of us are in the same position there. We're not not sure yet if, if we would actually be able to comply, which is okay. The standard hasn't come out yet, so um, we still have some time. And I think even when they do uh, publish the new standard, then there's even some, it sounds like there will be a year or two before it will be enforced thoroughly. So... Great. Well, it's good. I think this will be a useful session then. Um, so I wanted to just briefly talk about why do we need standards. And I think maybe we all have some different ideas too, or and I have a few of my own, but I pretty much borrowed these from some of the, yeah, Moza got it. <laughs> uh, so I've um, borrowed these from some organizations that will recognize. So According to the first one here is from um, the Clean Cooking Alliance. So they say that standards provide rigorous definitions and goals for stove and fuel performance, including efficiency, emission, safety, and durability. They provide a good foundation for national policies, support donor and investment decisions, and drive manufacturers to improve their technologies. So that's from Clean Cooking Alliance. And then one of the major standards bodies across the world, the ISO, says uh, consumers can have confidence that their products are safe, reliable, and of good quality. So they kind of focus it more on our customers and making sure that they're being served with high quality products. And I think these pretty much sum up most of the reasons that I've heard of. Um, in terms of you know, why we would want to have standards. Promoting good policies, governments can reference them in terms of regulation. Uh, donors or investors can now have sort of a benchmark to use and decide whether they want to put their money into a sector or a product or a company. And then it pushes manufacturers to kind of all meet a new level or a new bar in terms of product quality, performance, etc. So the, the standard that we're going to focus mainly on here is the, the new Kenya standard, which the title of that is uh, DKS 2912 2020. Again, I think it'll become KS 2912 once it's out of uh, draft form. So the title of the standard is Solid Biofuel, Sustainable Charcoal and Carbonized Briquettes for Household and Commercial Use. So we're going to go through kind of the major components of the standard so that we're all a little more familiar with those. And then uh, I think once I'm done with that, we can try to have a discussion about, you know, um, how this could affect our businesses. So. Um, first, what's included in the new KEB standard? So in terms of the scope, KEB states that this standard specifies requirements for sustainably produced charcoal and carbonized briquettes that are derived from forest plantation, sustainably harvested wood, and other forest products, byproducts and residues from wood processing industry, chemically untreated wood, herbaceous biomass, fruit biomass, aquatic biomass, agro-industrial residues like sugarcane bagasse, rice husks, etc., treated fecal sludge and organic market waste in lump and briquette form that is intended for household and commercial use. So fairly comprehensive. I think all of our products in our HFI Kenya group probably would be covered in this standard. I think the marked difference is that it does not cover uncarbonized briquettes or raw biomass briquettes. So this is only charcoal and carbonized briquettes. They also use the word sustainably produced, which infers that you know it's in compliance with the new uh, logging ban that's in place in Kenya. 
a couple of years ago. But otherwise, it's most of our feedstocks are covered here, um, and it's it's quite comprehensive. So, what are the requirements for carbonized briquettes, especially? They kind of split most of the requirements in the standard between charcoal and and carbonized briquettes. And um, so, I thought for this. Uh, seminar, we can just talk about the carbonized briquette component. If we do think that the charcoal piece is important, we can speak about that too. So what I did is I have just kind of summarized in a table uh, the major requirements. So what the standard lays out is a lot of maximum and minimum um, levels for different uh, parameters of the briquettes. So first, and uh, it's a lot of information to go through, so we'll take a little bit of time here. But first, it tells us about the acceptable raw materials. It doesn't go into a lot of detail other than the scope that I had on the previous slide. It tells us about foreign matter and how, oh, so uh, Beatrice has provided a, a clarification there. Um, thanks, Beatrice. So it, it also tells us about uh, foreign matter, which uh, should not be present in the briquettes. So this is really any type of um, uh, contaminant or debris, paper, um, uncarbonized material, plastics. It lays out a few examples, but leaves that also kind of open to interpretation. A bit. And then finally, it lists uh, various additives that we might use in the briquettes or charcoal uh, to, for example, aid in ignition or act as a binder. And it talks about some appropriate additives. I think for the most part, you know, we're familiar with most of these materials and I think our group probably wouldn't have any issues uh, with most of these uh, foreign matter additives and raw materials. So the next thing that it defines is what are the acceptable amounts of fines of so the small pieces that have broken off um, that can be present in a, in a bag of charcoal? And then also after being dropped in kind of a standard drop test, um, how many fines can be present in, uh, in the bag, in the sample bags after that dropping? So there's some specific numbers here. Essentially, the way that they do, they determine this is they use a sieve, which is a, a mesh of a defined size, and they dump the contents of the packaging onto that mesh. And anything that falls through the mesh is counted as fines or uh, debris, and anything that doesn't fall through is, is remains. So for the fines, you know, we know we have to maintain uh, no more than 2.5% by mass. Um, pieces with a size less than 15 millimeter. So uh, 1.5 centimeter, 15 millimeter. And then after dropping, no more than 5% with a size of 9.5 millimeter, so about one centimeter. Um, so that's a little bit specific. The other thing that the standard does, and most of the document itself, is actually describing how you do all these tests, how you make all these measurements. So it's either referencing other standards, like from ISO, or actually it ends up referencing a lot of the South African standards. Uh, but essentially, it, it'll tell whoever's running these tests in a laboratory or government agency, government laboratory, it'll um, tell that person how to carry out each of the tests, which what equipment's needed, how many pieces are needed for a proper sample, how to collect a sample. Um, so most of the standard document is actually telling uh, that test taker how to do those. So then there's a few things that actually will look familiar from our previous tech lunch where we talked about fuel composition. So those are moisture content, volatile matter, ash content, and fixed carbon. And you'll remember we talked about those 
those comprise the proximate analysis. So the standard requires that there's a proximate analysis on the product, and it gives us some maximums for moisture content, 10%, uh, volatile matter content, 25%, ash content, 27%, and the minimum, oops, sorry, I'm just gonna have to mute. Thanks. And the minimum for fixed carbon should be 44%. Um, so I won't go into detail. If, if these aren't familiar to you, you can reference the previous Tech Launch seminar. Um, the link is at the bottom here. But essentially, you know, these are, for the most part, I think these are achievable. I look back at test results from briquettes that I've tested in the past. And most of them, if not all, actually, I think, uh, met these requirements. I mean, I think the, the important one here is ash content and fixed carbon. And um, in most cases, the briquettes that, that I had looked at in the past, which are pretty standard, either sugar cane or coconut shell or groundnut shell, those had a fixed carbon content of at least 50% and usually above 60%. And the ash content typically was down around maybe 15 to 20%. But I think as long as we're doing a good job in our recipe, in our carbonization, if we're doing that, not adding too much binder, we should be able to meet these requirements. Uh, the last one is the calorific value. And the requirement there is 18 megajoules per kilogram. So that tells us, again, about the energy content of the briquette and it it's the calorific value is really dependent on these other properties so if we have a high fixed carbon content we know we have a high calorific value um, again in the tests in the briquettes that i looked back on from tests we've done at dlab uh, most of those are meeting this requirement i think the important thing here is that there may be some briquettes which are used for non-household purposes, non-cooking purposes, especially if you're using maybe lower quality feedstock to make briquettes for, for example, chicken brooders, those could be less than 18 megajoules per kilogram. Um, so we know we need kind of lower heat output and longer burn duration for that type of briquette. So that was one thing I noticed that could be an issue. And, and in the applications that are covered in the standard they do say commercial applications so that could be you know commercial heating space heating in uh, in um, chicken burgers which i know is a common um, use of some briquettes so this is a, an overview that those are all of the parameters that are defined the other piece that was defined at the end of the standard and i'll just present here briefly is the packing and marking requirements. So now on, on your packaging, you'll have to also include some additional information if you want to be compliant with the standard. So it's something to start thinking about now. So one on the packing, they outline essentially that you need to have some packaging. So it's pretty open in terms of the material, um, but it says multi-wall bags, corrugated board, or any suitable packaging such as to be acceptable to maintain the integrity. So as long as you're compliant with the previously stated um, requirements, especially probably for the dropping resistant and the fines, uh, then it's an appropriate packaging. And then what they say here is that the units of packaging should be anywhere from 1 kg to 50 kg. So I would guess that you'll have to state specifically on the packaging um, what the size, the, the contents, quantity of the contents is. So the next thing, which is a little more in depth here, is the marking. And there's a bunch of requirements in terms of what types of marks you need on the packaging. Probably a lot of these you already have, but you know, being clear about what the product is, who's making it, when it was made, the mass and the, the origin of the contents raw materials used, 
any handling and storage information for the customer. And then kind of a disclaimer or something explaining that the, sorry, this should go away. The usage should be in a well-ventilated environment, um, which I think is good practice anyway. So I believe this was all there was for marking. There may have been some additional kind of optional requirements that you could see in the standard. Um, so I, that's about it for what I was going to present about the standard. I have a copy of it, of the draft that we can pull up and look at, but here are a couple of resources. So the standard itself is the title. Um, CCAK is actually coming out with some quick guides, um, which I'm not sure if they've released yet, but if they have, the quick guides actually go through some previously published uh, Kenyan standards on cook stoves, on alcohol fuels, and ethanol um, appliances. So uh, those are also, I think, going to be really useful. Hopefully, they do a quick guide for this standard as well. And then one of the things that was uh, discussed in the standard, I didn't talk about much here, but was the need for stating compliance with some quality uh, protocol in your factory or in your production. They did talk about um, there's an ISO standard for quality um, assurance, I think is the term they use, quality assurance. But they did say that you could use some other approach to quality, but it should be communicated, especially if you're you know, dealing with, say, like a wholesale or a distributor. They would want to know something about your approach to quality control. So again, I, I'll mention that uh, DLab has proposed some quality testing and reporting protocols. Um, <clears throat> I think the ISO requirements for their uh, quality assurance standard is pretty high. Uh, it's, and this would be a little more specific to our sector. So I just linked that again in case you want to uh, check that out. But that would have to be a part of your plan for being compliant with the CAP standard. So that's all I have. I was going to open it up to questions. Thanks again. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, or Beatrice, if you have anything you want to add, because I know Beatrice has been more involved than I have for sure in this. So yeah, please. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, indeed, I think it's good that you really highlighted, you know, the, the, the major and the priority information that briquette producers has uh, to focus on, you know, to, to make sure they are compliant with the standards. So the standards, uh, it's, it's really, I mean, to um, enhance and highlight, uh, you know, the, the, the briquette industry in Kenya. It's not uh to be considered as um, an examination you know or, or uh, a certificate to gate or an obstacle or whatever you have really to um uh to understand that these standards will really uh, i think uh, lift and move you know the the briquette industry in the in the next level uh, what I had in my mind every time I, I participated in the technical committee meetings, it's for me, it was really to set realistic standards. Um, because um, uh, I didn't want, uh, you know, the technical committee to set super high standards that will kill, you know, this emerging industry, even if, you know, we know that briquettes have been produced in Kenya since the early 90s. Uh, but we keep talking about the nas nascent uh, industry and I didn't want also to set a super low standards that will affect also the, um, I mean, the, the market, the reputation, because I know that when we are producing a good quality briquettes, every time, I don't know, maybe you are doing the same thing with your clients, but I'm always asking if they have ever used briquettes. Unfortunately, Sometimes I'm getting negative, uh, you know, feedback and people, they say, yes, I use, but uh, they were very difficult to light or I got plenty of ashes or plenty of soil. So I went back to charcoal. 
So I think we know that there is plenty of variety of uh, briquettes in Kenya, different variety of raw materials, binders, etc. But it's very important that um, we show that briquettes, it's a very good uh, alternative cooking solutions, you know, and a very good quality one. So the minimum requirements, in fact, he had um, all the, the criteria uh, that uh, Dan uh, showed you today, they are coming from um, different, yeah, this one, they are coming from multiple uh, testing that has been conducted by uh, the Department of Chemistry of Nairobi University, Professor Kitinji, maybe you know him, uh, by also KIFRI, the Kenyan Forestry Research Institute, uh, especially the contact is Nelly Odwar, um, and also uh, by, the, by KIRDI, so the, the Kenyan um, Industrial Research uh, Institute. So I think if you have never done it, and they, I mean they conducted all these uh, tests with really briquettes, carbonized briquettes produced here in Kenya. And I would highly advise you, if you have not done it, you know, to uh, do it and to do it with at least two, even three lab, you know. And I think if we raise our voice all together, maybe we can do it again, me, I'm willing to do it again for my briquettes and uh, maybe to negotiate, you know, to negotiate maybe your the tasting fees if you have never done it. And because I found out that we got different kind of results and especially uh, with Skifree and Nairobi University, they were, uh, the, the test results were almost similar, but with Skirdi not at all. And why? Because in Skirdi, we drop our briquettes in 2016 and it took long and I don't know what they did with it, but uh, the results, they were really weird, but for K3 and uh, Nairobi University, we conducted the result, the, sorry, the test uh, like with a one year difference and the results, they were almost uh, similar. But I mean, you know, you can even uh, conduct a test, I think Dan will tell, uh, tell us and confirm you can drop you know uh, one kilo of your briquettes every year and you will always get slightly some differences you yeah. know mm -hmm. yes because it depends so uh, we had a lots of discussion about i remember the maximum ash content because at the beginning mm -hmm. you know they were uh, proposing 20 percent and we said akuna mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not going mm -hmm. to make it yes yeah, so we have been very uh yeah I mean, we discussed a lot. And when I say we, maybe I don't know if, mm. you know, who was sitting at this uh, technical committee. So mm. um, you had some uh, representative from Clean Cooking Association of Kenya, especially uh, Paul Ayalo. You had uh, Maxwell Musioka from uh, GIZ Kenya. Uh, you had Kefri, uh, the representative from uh, S. EI Africa, so Stockholm Environment Institute of Africa, Dr. Rocio Diaz Chavez, and another research scientist. Um, you had also some representative from KIRD, but K3, yeah, they, they were around two or three, three research scientists from K3, and they were really active. And uh, so for the private sector, I mean, there was only Jairus from Sanivation and myself, yeah. And most and Jerry sometimes couldn't attend, so sometimes I was really alone, <laughs> yeah, representing the you know the private sector. Uh, yes, yeah, so I really it's the reason why it was so important for me, you know, to collect plenty of comments, feedback, because I I really wanted um, that you know we are uh, um, I mean creating standards for all of us, you know. Yeah, so, and also, I think, yeah, for example, for the packing, they are asking many things, but I don't know for you, but currently, I know there are many things we are uh, compliant with, like already in our stickers, we say that it's five kilo bags, that we, they are sustainably produced in Kasigao, Taitata Beta. It's written that we have our company name. Uh, we don't say the, the feedstock, but I mean, Already, if, I mean, you are covering on your stickers uh, most of the information, it's okay, I mean, yeah. 
So, and I think we will be improving, uh, yeah, through, yeah, throughout the, the months, throughout the years. So currently what you need to know is that the, um, the standards, they are in the, in the hands of the approval committee meeting, and it's going to take a couple of months uh, before being gazetted in, uh, most probably, of course, in 2021. 20, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Beatrice, do you, well, thank you, Beatrice, for the explanation and thanks for representing also. I mean, that was a lot of meetings you had to attend, I think. And yes. Yeah, I only, I think I made it to a couple of them, but yeah, it was very clear that everybody who was involved was, you know, very passionate about this and Beatrice really did a great job representing the entire sector so that was a huge burden on you i think but <laughs> yes yeah. yes sometimes it was not easy yet to yeah to, to to make sure that it was you know when especially when we are really negotiating all these uh, criteria you know the percentage you know i was mm. no 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 yeah i really need <laughs> yeah so um, I don't. I, I would like to know if some of the participants have already tested their briquettes and with which uh, institute. And um, yeah, because I, I've seen when I join you, yeah, I've seen that most of you you don't know if you are compliant. So is the reason why I'm. I would like to know: Have you ever tested your briquettes? Because if you have tested your briquettes, you have got, you know, a file, you know, with all these uh, criteria, moisture, volatile matter, fixed carbon, etc., with the percentage. Okay. Yeah, Marie. Hello. Hi, Dan. Yeah, hi. Who is this? Is this Marie? Uh, my name is Mary, actually. Mary. Mary. From oh, okay. Uh, ah, so okay, it's... okay. Thank you for joining. Okay. Great. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I came in late. It's because I, okay. I am still on another meeting, but then I thought it's, it's good that I attend this meeting. Thank you. And for so, joining. yeah, I need to say thank you so much for, for the support that the stakeholders offered me during development of this standard. Beatrice, thank you for always being and everyone else who was involved and maybe I wanted to clarify, to clarify something that you've said about the standard and uh, how soon you think it will be out well uh, the standard was approved passed through the last approval um, stage uh, this September and so uh, I hope that it will be out it will be gazetted before the end of this month that is October and so let, let's say tentatively by November the standard will be available in our web store, um, you okay. know, so you, you, can, mm -hmm. you can purchase and, and go through it. Basically, um, nothing much has changed from the, the draft that I shared with you during balloting. And I'm sure most of you are able to, to get the draft. And Beatrice, I know you, you always share with people, which is a good thing. And yeah, I am really happy to see how uh, you have embraced the standard and how all of you are excited about now the standard and how we are going to improve this industry of brigades having the quality uh, products, you know, and even for fairness. And also we are able to penetrate through the market, you know, both locally and international. So yeah, I am really happy to see, um, to hear the feedback from you guys. And thank you so much. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Mary, for the clarification, yeah, because I didn't know where we were now uh, and how long it will take, you know, uh, before the standards to be gazetted. Yeah, thanks a lot. Happy to hear you. <laughs> and actually, I had a question for Mary or uh, Beatrice. Do you, can you uh, describe to the group a little bit how the, the standard will be enforced uh, in the coming, after it's been released? and should uh, the companies here be required to comply with it immediately or is there some grace period? Well, usually what happens when the standard is out, then uh, we start implementing it. I mean, getting the, the goods from the market through our, mar our department market surveillance and uh, those who will be coming to get the certification. You see, uh, the whole point of having a standard is so that the manufacturers uh, can get those certifications 
because I know most of you are using, are selling this product, you know, informally. Maybe you have a tender, you supply to people, but then you're not able to penetrate the formal market, like the supermarket and, you know, you cannot even import your products outside. So what happens, export, sorry, what happens right now, I mean, the standard will be of great help to the likes of Akina Beatrice, who would want now again now to penetrate the formal market. But then again, um, through our market surveillance department, we will be able to implement that standard. We'll be, you know, uh, getting the products from the market randomly and test them against that standard because I believe this standard was developed with the help of the stakeholders and the um, CCAK, the umbrella. And yeah, there will be no grace period, I don't think so. The standard will be implemented as soon as it's out. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, does anyone else have a question or a concern? I think Dorothy, you mentioned something about uh, support for testing, and um, and yeah, I think yeah, that's something. I think yeah, Beatrice and and I and actually more UBPA. Uh, there was a group that was looking into accessing testing for the entire group. Um, so we're we're picking up on that actually now and for a UBPA activity, which would include I think everyone here in HFI Kenya also. So um, yeah, one thing I was wondering is if we could negotiate some group rate for testing with KIRD or CAPFRI or University of Nairobi. So stay tuned for that. Can I have a question for Mary, please? Hmm, please. Yes, uh, Mary, uh, uh, I would just like to know uh, how you're going to mitigate uh, this because you find that there are those people who are not bothered or interested about exporting their briquettes or selling them to the supermarket and they will produce their briquettes in whatever way so long as they make money out of, of it because uh, briquettes is actually... Um, providing employment and business opportunities for so many other people. And uh, you find that when, um, as a company, I want my briquettes to meet the standards, it will force me to actually abide by the standards and I make sure that I do everything to produce my briquette to the standard that is required. Do you think don't you see that uh, there's going to be a very unlevel playing ground because you know most Kenyans do not really care about standards so long as they get it cheaply. I will be spending so much to produce my briquettes while these others are not spending that much. And so I'm, I'm not able to market and sell my produce, my quality briquettes in a way that I can benefit out of it. And I, I, I am seeing this going to be a challenge and I don't know how you are thinking about it and how you can mitigate this. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, I would like to know um, what exactly is your question? Um, the fear the, of you so much? The and unfairness, the unfairness of companies that will be uh, meeting the CAPE standard versus those that are just in business as usual and they don't care about this. So because I'm sure you're not going to be able to test all the briquettes produced in Kenya. That is for sure. Uh, I, I understand your point and I understand where you're coming from, but I can tell you for free, if you have an S mark, that gives you a wider market as opposed to someone who doesn't have an S mark. Because you who don't have an S mark, you'll be limited to people around your locality who knows that you produce these brigades in as much as maybe as cabs, we may not be able to come and reach you and, and, and know that for sure you're selling, uh, you're selling substandard quote unquote um, brigades. And someone who has, a, who has an S mark has a wider market to even market themselves 
enriching, you know, you basically you can reach, your market is everywhere across the country and even outside the country. So I think you have an advantage over the person who doesn't have it, if you look at it that way. And uh, you know, your product will be slightly expensive than someone who doesn't have an SMAC. That's my way of thinking. But ultimately, we cannot be able for sure to reach, the, to reach everyone and uh, you know, standardize all the brigades. But with the help of you manufacturers, you can be able to point out so-and-so is selling, we don't have a, a standard. And that's how we are able to reach them and, and ensure that they are producing um, brigades that are of good quality. That's the whole point. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Okay, Mary. Yes, thank you very much for that feedback. Uh, it does answer, but not fully, because I think these are things you, uh, as 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 you come up with the standards, you also need to start thinking about and finding ways of how to reduce this so that uh, we we have Kenyans because this is coming up with them. Um, uh, 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 an advert or an awareness creation, a public awareness creation that will try to educate the community and the public about the briquettes and the cook stoves. So if there can be some way of um, also mitigating this so that, that the customer is not ending up even more confused because uh, just like I'm saying, not everybody is after selling to the supermarkets because we know the story of the supermarkets. So long as you are able to sell your products, I think there is need to think about it even more because it is a big challenge. I also understand, but uh, it would be good for the authorities to start thinking of how they can help the entrepreneurs and even the customers at the end of the day and make sure that they are using quality products and even those people who are in the business are actually getting a benefit from whatever they are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that feedback. I have noted it. Thank you. Yes, Mary, I have a question also yeah, about the fees of the, to get, you know, the S mark for uh, the briquette producer. Do you know yeah, the procedure, how long it will take, how much it will cost to get the S mark and uh, how often is it every year we will have to renew it for a certain amount of fees? Do you have some information about that? Okay, about that, how, how do you get it? How do you go about it? So usually you will come to our offices. Actually, the, the forms are also available online. You can get it, you can download them through from our website. And then after downloading, you'll fill them in. And then you, you'll come to our offices where you'll drop them. And then that's when you'll start telling them about your product, blah, blah, blah. And then after you drop them, there's an officer in quality assurance who will be assigned your file. And they will come to you where you are doing your uh, uh, manufacturing, where you are packaging and all, all that. And then they, are, they will pick a sample or two for testing against the standard that you have already developed. If, this, if your product complies, then you are going to be given an, a certification. And then later you're going to, give, to be given those um, stickers. So usually, how long does it take? Well, I, I will say, I will say about two months, and then the fee. The fee, I'm not quite sure about it. Usually, um, initially, manufacturers used to renew these every year, but right now it's two after two years, and then now the fee you'll pay for two years. If you are paying, you'll be categorized. We categorize our manufacturers these large manufacturers and their SMEs. If, I don't know how um, charcoal manufacturers will be, will be categorized, I don't know, but then it will depend on how, ma how many employees you have. Then, then now um, that qualifies you to be an SMEs or large manufacturers. 
So depending on where you are classified, then there's a different fee for, for each category. And I think, I think for small manufacturers, it's around um, 5,000 or so. So for two years, that will be times two, 10,000. 10, I am not quite sure about the fee, but then that's something that we can always come from the relevant department. What was the other question? No, yes, it was a question, but I mean, also many briquette producers currently, they are even not SMEs, we are M, <laughs> micro, uh, you know, enterprise. So yeah. yeah, I think we will have really to consider if it's relevant or not, depending I think on our production capacity. It, of yeah. course, as uh, Dorothy said, if it's relevant, depending on the market we are penetrating because currently, yeah, we are all producing and selling to different market segments. And uh, yeah, when people are happy with the quality, they, I mean, they are becoming regular clients uh, with the S mark or not. I think the S mark is really penetrating, as you say, the formal market, uh, supermarkets, because even I've seen that in some uh, eco-friendly, uh, um spaces you know a restaurant or whatever who have some shops you, they don't require the s mark you know yeah so it's true that we will have to be very um clear on what we are expecting by obtaining the s mark but i think it's a good exercise anyway yeah to make sure that we are compliant with the the technical i mean requirements the criteria yeah to to promote um to promote you know the use of the briquettes and uh yeah with uh, a good quality uh, level mm. but uh, yet we shall see i think with uh yeah as dan say that we are uh, if some we, we should know you know and um and ask all the briquette producer from the association if they have already tested when yes or no and uh, then to you know approach the, um, the the research institute who are conducting this kind of test and see if uh, how much it will cost because i think it's important that people know where they are actually okay thank you beatrice for the feedback also Okay, great. Thank you, Beatrice and Mary. Uh, anyone else have a question they want to bring up, either Mary or Beatrice or I? Um, Moza, we haven't heard from you. Kevin, Joel, do you have anything, any concerns that you have related to the standard or are you, are you happy to see it coming out? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm happy to see it coming out and learning more about all this. I hope it will work out soon. Great. Thanks, Moza. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we'll we'll finish up. We're we're approaching two o'clock, so it's and I think there's another meeting for some people, um, another webinar happening. So um, Kevin, Joel or Amadi, any questions from any of you? Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, hopefully you had a nice lunch. Thank you, especially to Mary uh, for being our guest today and, and joining in on short notice. And for Beatrice, especially for really representing our sector uh, in the standards development. So, great. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And Thank if you we, so much. if I guess one qu last question for you, Mary, if anyone has follow up questions, do you, do you want to take questions from uh, businesses uh, yourself or? Would you prefer that we consolidate our questions and come to you? What's the best way to to get more information if we need? Come up again, please. 
Sorry? I, I was just saying, what's the best way to get more information if we need to in the future? We need to contact Kebs. Should we come to you directly or um, is there a better way to, to, to get questions answered? Uh, it depends on the nature of the of the questions you have. If okay. it's some do with the standardization, then then I'll be happy to help. Mm -hmm. But if it's something else about approvals and all those things, then I would rather you I'd rather you contact Kebs directly because some of these things are way beyond me. Especially if it has to do with maybe your S mark has delayed all those. Those are things that are way past me. Okay. Yeah, but then if it, these simple things about standardization, then I will be happy to help. Any question that I can be able to help, I'll, 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 I'll be, you can direct it to me. Okay, okay, that yeah. sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Dan. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, you too. Okay. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye, thank you too.